Friends, we're in the Ephesians series. We are getting towards the end of it, which makes me very sad because I have loved walking through this and being challenged and growing in this series. But uh, today we find ourselves asking the question, how will the church reveal Christ? And we are looking at the church revealing Christ in the workplace. I mean, you want practical hands-on theology, buckle up. Today's the day, right? There's, There's not a lot of this ethereal putting together pieces. There's just a reality of what Paul says. Now, I want to be clear on something. We're going to use some language today um, out of Ephesians that we as Americans have rootedness in, and it's, it's painful, okay? We're going to talk about slavery. I need you to understand what we're not talking about. We are not talking about 16th century moving forward to the 19th century slavery, where Western Europe went and harvested lives out of Africa and brought them as slaves. That is not what we're talking about. That is a blight and a black eye on our history in this nation, and it, and, and it raises a bunch of emotions because we are living in the effects and the, and the fruits of that sin even to this day, where we removed from humanity uh, the beautiful image of God. We, we told them they were worthless and did things we never culturally should have ever happened. You may say that was a few hundred years ago. That's fine, but that is a blight on our society and our culture, and we have to recognize that is not what we're talking about today. We are going to be talking about slavery in the context of the Greco-Roman Empire, and when they talk of slaves, they mean a few different things. First of all, they could mean an indentured servant, someone who borrowed money, couldn't pay it back, and they were given um, the title of slave. They were owned by someone who they were in debt to, and they worked that debt off and eventually were set free. Then there's people who were conquered by, uh, so let's say Rome conquers Carthage, Carthage, which they did, and they took the best of those people back to Rome as slaves and servants. That happened. Okay, so a very broken system, but uh, Paul talks about it. Scripture doesn't shy away from these topics, and today we're going to deal with it. But um, as we do, I I think one of the things that we have to look at is the understanding and the reality that um, we are called to serve wholeheartedly. And we recognize that the church in the workplace is a place for us to give witness to Christ and his work in our life in magnificent ways. But um, we live in a weird culture in America. Like, who here ever watched The Office? Anybody? Oh, such a genius TV show. I'm not saying everything in it I agreed with, but man, Michael Scott, that guy just killed me. And his little world's best boss mug. And he's like, yeah, it turns out he like bought it for himself. I love that. Um, and, and you look at this idea of the world's best boss. Like, what is the world's best boss? What does that consist of? And what kind of person would that be? And um, there's shows called Undercover Boss. Anybody ever see that? Where this guy puts on a bad plastic mustache and is like, hey, Tom, why don't you teach me what you do? You know, and you you can tell he's never held a hammer in his life. And then they walk him through it, and then he ends up, like, giving scholarships to kids or something. And and you see it, and you're like, okay, that's a pretty good boss. But what attracts us, like, um, as as people to, to those leaders and to define people as a great boss, someone who challenges us and inspires us, who doesn't allow us to just do the mundane work, but engages us and gives us the opportunity to challenge and grow. What does the world's best boss look like? And I know for me, like, um, because it, terrifying as it is, I'm kind of in charge at church, and um, and and so when when like we're in a meeting and I'm talking and I can hear myself becoming Michael Scott, and there's this voice in me going, "Quit talking, quit talking, it's happening." And I'm like, "I can't, I'm going off the cliff," and I just accelerate off. It's terrible because you want to be a, a person who's good in authority, but you also understand that we answer as well. Leaders answer to authority as well, and we're going to talk about both today, and we need to understand that um, leaders and followers are a necessary part in this, uh, in, in this system of the world, 
There are certain people who love to just go to work and do the work. And there are certain people who have vision and leadership capacities. And um, their uniqueness in that is as unique as the person who wants to just do the work. And we need to celebrate both but understand we're each uniquely gifted in that. I find myself quite often drawn towards and attracted to, to being around leaders who have two real qualities to them. Leaders who possess vision and love people. When, when a leader has those things, I show up at their door unannounced sometimes, just like, hey, how's it going? Just thought I'd say hi. Because I love that quality. Someone who can hold vision and tr- love people, but allow them to participate in it. I think that's a fascinating thing. I think it's rooted in Christianity. And so when I find myself recognizing there's certain things I aspire to be, and I want to learn to follow better. So, so we're going to talk about this today, and we're going to use the lens, and, the, and appropriately so, the lens of Ephesians chapter um, 6 here, verses 5 through 9. Again, when we lean into this language, we are not talking about the, the just pre-modern version of slavery. We're talking about Greco-Roman, and Paul says this. Slaves, obey your earthly masters with respect and fear and with sincerity of heart, just as you would obey Christ. Obey them not only to win their favor when their eye is on you, so when the boss is watching, you work harder, but as slaves of Christ, doing the will of God from your heart. That's an interesting thing. Serve wholeheartedly as if you were serving the Lord, not people, because you know that the Lord will reward each one for whatever good they do, whether they are slave or free. And masters, treat your slaves in the same way. Do not threaten them since you know, and this is important, do not threaten them, since you know that he is both, he who is in heaven is both their master and yours. And he's basically saying, don't forget, God doesn't have our same system of value. And there is no favoritism with him. Paul writes this in an effort to instruct and guide the early church to live lives that are visible in their transformation. They are changing the culture around them by being present in the lives they live. Has anybody here ever heard the term, I serve at the pleasure of, like the president? Anybody ever heard that? It's a term often used towards the presidency of the United States. Here's why they say it. A person who serves at the pleasure of the, of the president is someone at the cabinet level, okay? So let's just say the chief of staff for the president. He serves at the pleasure of the president, meaning whatever the president's goals, those are his goals. And if the president grows tire of, tired of him, this person who serves at the pleasure of does not have any of the civil protections afforded to a civil servant. They are able to be canned like a peach by the president like that with no answer. I'm tired. You serve at the pleasure of, right? So we understand that that term actually applies to us. We serve at the pleasure of the Lord Jesus Christ. We serve to be his hands and his feet in this world in the way that he sees fit, in the way that he sees best. The one thing we know is he's not going to can us like a peach and throw us off to the side or put us on the shelf. He seeks to employ his spirit-filled church in the transformation of your life and the world around you. We serve at the pleasure of the Lord Jesus Christ. And in stark contrast to serving at the pleasure of the president, who those people have no real civil protection, we serve at the pleasure of him who has guarded us with his very life. And we can serve wholeheartedly and faithfully, even as Paul proclaimed, because we have value. One of the ways we see the value of humans who are trapped in slavery in this society is by a letter written to a person named Philemon. Philemon is actually the name of a book in the Bible, just a little later on than this, and Philemon is a slave owner. Now, we need to take a minute and understand something. Philemon owned human beings. He trafficked in humanity. That's horrible, right? But Paul knows this person, and Paul writes him a letter because Philemon once owned somebody named Onesimus, and Onesimus had stolen from his owner and run away. These are punishable by death, these offenses. They are punishable by death. But Onesimus had come to know Christ when he encountered Paul in a different, in a different city. 
And Paul writes a letter to Philemon, and he puts that letter in the hand of the runaway slave who deserves to be executed, and he sends Onesimus home to Philemon. And he says this to him. Receive this one, Onesimus, not as a slave, but as a brother in Christ, for he is dear to me. He is dear to me. Don't value him just on the world's standing. Value him now in the eyes of Christ, is what Paul's saying. And if you see fit, even though he's done you wrong, charge it to my account. And if you're willing, send him back to me. I could use Onesimus in the service of the kingdom. That just tells us something. Lawbreakers, people deserving of death and punishment, and people who have done wrong are still people God redeems and uses for his purposes. Onesimus was a slave. Philemon was an owner. And what was Paul advocating for? His liberation to live freely in the power of the gospel, even though he had made past mistakes. So we look at that and we recognize that what's being called upon to the church is this. Paul's saying it, in effect, live with integrity. Have integrity in who you are. Integrity matters in what we do. And we recognize that this passage says a lot about it. And it says it in verse 6 when it says, Obey your masters not only to win their favor when their eye is on you. Who here is happy when the boss is out of the office for the day? Anybody? Unless your boss is in this room, then just shake your head no. But if you you are, you got to participate here with me. Anybody here glad? When the boss is gone, you're like, yeah, why? Because lunch can be a little more of an afternoon event, <laughs> right? And coming to work on time is on time-ish because when the cat's away, the mice will play, right? We have this idea that when we're not being watched, we can be a little different. Integrity says that who you are alone is who you are when you're watched. And Paul leans into it and says, don't just work hard when the boss's eye is on you. Work hard all the time and do everything you do to the glory of God. Why? Why is Paul saying that? Because integrity is a full-time job. Integrity matters. If you're an employee, integrity matters. Being able to trust and lean into someone, knowing that they will value what you're doing the way you do, and you can hand that off. Integrity matters in the workplace and in the individual lives of the church because it's how we communicate the gospel. It's how we, as the people of God, don't take advantage when people aren't looking and get a little extra for us. We lean into the identity of Christ, and we recognize that we are called to serve in costly ways, not always beneficial ways. Integrity matters within the church, and we recognize that your behavior is not contingent on your boss's behavior. If you're an employee in this place and you're like, you know what, my boss is a dirt bag. Can you say dirt bag in church? I, I did. We're going to own it. So you say, you know what, my boss is a dirt bag and I don't trust him. I'm sick of it. She's mean, moody. He's a jerk. He yells at us, whatever. And you know what, when he's away, I'm going to take half the day off and I'm going to still fill out a full-time card. Why? Because you're a doorknob and I don't have to listen. And we justify things in our hearts that Scripture doesn't give allowance for. Scripture calls us to have integrity no matter the character of our leaders. And we'll apply this a little later, but we need to understand it matters. But we also look and we see, what does Paul say in Scripture later on about this very thing? And he says in Colossians 3.23, whatever you do, work at it with all your heart, not as though you're working for your bosses. Work at it with all your heart as though you're working for the Lord not human masters. And you may say, but Eric, this is to slaves. I guarantee you tomorrow morning you're not going to feel like getting up and going to work to pay off your house and your car. We are slaves to certain things in this life. We do what we must, not always what we want. Why? Because in many ways we are owned by our own choices and things like that. We must, as the church, learn to work with all our hearts as though we were working for the Lord, remembering that we were bought at a very dear price. Though Christ chose us first, we responded. And if you're a Christian who's given your life to Christ, you now serve at the pleasure of your Lord and Savior, not your impulses and your desires. It's just hard because sometimes your impulses and desires are perfectly justified in this world's ethic. They're just not justified in Scripture. Paul calls us to this. 
work with all your heart and do it as though you're working for the Lord. And don't do it for the human masters, for the people who fail all the time. Do it because your life was called in service to the king of heaven. That's pretty good news and some pretty good clarity. But then we also have to look back and say, okay, as a worker, that's fine, but what about the employers? What about those who are in in authority? What about the, the shift leader? Or what about the teacher? Or what about those who are given influence? What does Scripture say about them? I love how Paul words this out, and he does so without any apology. He says, and masters, treat your slaves in the same way. Do not threaten them, since you know that he who is both their master and yours is in heaven. They get threatened with God. Like, oh, you're good with that. Okay, so um, that, that seems a little overwhelming to someone who's in authority at times, that, that their master is in heaven. So the slave and the master are equal in the eyes of God. God has no hierarchy on this, and he calls leaders to remember that God doesn't play favorites. God doesn't have a favorite employee, a favorite church member. He just loves you, and he proved it in the life, death, and resurrection of Christ and in the sending of the Holy Spirit. God doesn't play favorites. So if you're an authority, maybe you shouldn't use your authority to terrorize those beneath you because it's your turn finally. It's your turn to pay back maybe. Maybe you should repay good for the evil that was done to you when you were on the bottom rung. But we recognize that God calls leaders to serve with clarity and with purpose. And the clarity is this. A leader's job in Scripture, no matter your occupation, is to draw out of someone their desire to know Jesus Christ by your example and to follow him and then empower all their God-given gifts to give glory to God in their life. Empower them to become everything God made them to be. You become their greatest advocate. You become someone who leads with a shovel in one hand, digging the hole with them, You're right in the trenches. You're working alongside in your own unique giftedness, not to prove you're a hard worker, but to show them the way. As a leader, people are watching. Your job is to do something Scripture calls discipleship. You need to lead with clarity and purpose. Your clarity and purpose is not the bottom line of the business and the profits and losses. Though those go hand in hand, it's nice to have, but the fact is, Your job is to raise up and release into life people with God-given talents and gifts. And you're in charge of not only like spotting them and celebrating them, but discipling them to know Jesus Christ and make him known in the way they work and serve under your influence. It's a heavy and high calling, but it's yours as a leader. And you can't threaten and abuse. Abusive leaders are the worst. When they're like, that's fine, I'll just write you up. Oh, who? I mean, aren't those managers the worst? When, when I was, I worked at Round Table Pizza in California when I was in high school, and it's awesome because it was, I mean, it was kind of featured after um, King Arthur, who was English and probably made terrible pizza. But um, you seem okay with it. And so um, I worked at Round Table Pizza, and we had this one assistant manager. His name was Ron. He thought he was like G.I. Joe, so we called him Ronbo. And, um, and we had a lot of fun with Ron. And he would, like, walk around. He's like, you want to do dishes? And I was like, well, I don't know. You're going to be doing them the rest of your life. Ooh. And then I'd be back there doing dishes. <laughs> I shouldn't have said that to Ronbo. He's still in charge, right? But, but you get these bosses who are always threatening you always kind of overlording you, and, you, and you, you come to kind of hate that and resent it. But the reality is that we as leaders and as followers are called to one master who doesn't play favorites, and the high calling of Christ is to say the same as those who are in charge and those who follow. Know God, follow God with all your heart. Make him known to the world. Be an evangelist and preach the gospel. And a lot of times we get the opportunity, eight hours a day, five days a week, to preach the gospel to the world around us in our coworkers' lives. We get to share that with one another. We get to be the hands and feet of Christ. We don't want to miss the opportunity of our work lives 
saying something different than our Christian lives. Christianity is not a Sunday occupation. We worship on Sundays and we prove who we love Monday through Friday or Monday through Saturday. We live it out. So how does this apply to me? How does this apply to me? I want to start with students. I want to lean in with you guys and talk with you for a minute because um, I, I dealt with some teachers who were tyrants, but I will tell you this first and foremost, I drove them to it. And um, I'm, as, I'm probably as guilty as, as anyone, but I was a follower, I was a child, and I, was, I always had the funny joke at the wrong time that would ruin the lesson, simultaneously making me happy, and then the wrath and rage of said teacher would descend on me like an owl, just who, and it'd come down, it was just awful. And, um, and I want to say this with, with humility and honesty, um, for students, you've been put under authority, to learn, to live under authority and still function. It's important that you learn to do that because everybody has a boss when you get old. You may think, when I get old and buy a house and I get a job, I ain't answering to nobody. Your mortgage called. You're answering. <laughs> you know? <laughs> you know? Just, just have that independence with your car loan. And don't be mad when the tow truck shows up, right? Like, you, you're you not as independent as you think. We have to learn to live under authority. And we do that in the classroom. We learn to listen and follow rules, not to just be good, but to be people who can follow well because we are all called to follow Christ. So students, in your work, in your engagement in school, in all that you do, honor God and work as though you're doing it for the Lord. Employees, laborers, and assistants, you need to understand, your work speaks volumes of who you love. It speaks volumes of who you love. If you love Jesus Christ, your work will reflect it. And it's not easy. It's not easy to be under a tyrant's thumb. But I want to say this to all students, employees, laborers, and assistants. You are called to love the tyrant who rules over you ruthlessly. You are called to love the tyrant above you. Not because it's okay what they're doing, but because you don't know what broke them. But you do know the one who can heal them. See, we justify our hatred, and we send people to hell in a handbasket thinking it's okay because they were mean. But we don't remember when they were a little kid, they got called names, they got bullied. Or maybe they've been trying to prove to their dad that they are enough all their life and they've never measured up and they've tried to be a tyrannical, hardcore leader and they've tried and tried and they're a failure in their own eyes even though they're a tyrant in yours. You don't know what broke them. You just know this. Jesus Christ loved them. He died for them and he will give witness to himself through you if you will follow them by loving them. It makes no sense to the tyrant to be loved, to be followed with respect and grace. It is your job to do. It is your job to do. I remember I was working in construction in San Diego, which, by the way, I'm super bad at. And, um, and my dad was good at it. My brother was good at it. So I thought, you know, a high school job. I was a senior, uh, junior going into my senior year. It was the summer, and I got hired to hang drywall, which turns out you have to be strong for that and not cry at work. And, um, and so I'm at work, and we're, we're actually working in David Jeremiah's church out in Shadow Mountain, hanging all the drywall on the ceiling. It was a special kind of horror. It was awful. And um, so we're hanging drywall. And I remember one day, now I'm like $7 an hour grunt labor, you know. I just, Eric, pick up dirt, put it down. I, I don't know what I'm doing, you know, because they realized I had limited giftedness. And, um, and so one day I'm walking by this thing, and there's these huge beams that ran through the church all the way the length of it. And there were next to the beams or around the beams were these big uh, kind of walkways. And they were enclosed in drywall and stuff. And one day I walked by and I saw one of the $24 an hour laborers kind of squatted down on his haunches uh, chewing sunflower seeds, just spitting seeds and stuff. I'm like, what you doing? And he's like, I'm killing time. 30 minutes left. I'm not going to start a new project. But I don't want to go home early. I want to get paid. And I was just like, oh, I didn't know we could do that. I guess that's what you get to do when you make the most money. That's really, really awesome, and I'm super excited for it, right? I, I all of a sudden learned an ethic. If you're talented, if you're good, there's different rules for you. Be careful the messages you believe that are lies. 
When you're young, you're looking up at leaders, but it's not always a good example. Be discerning as students, as employees, as laborers, as people with great skills. Have integrity the way you lead those who are grunt laborers below you. And honor your example to them and don't teach them a lie. Employers, bosses, teachers, and leaders. I want to lean in on teachers for a minute. Um, I, like Whitney Houston, believe that children are the future. And, um, and I think it matters how we treat our kids and how we educate them. I want to tell you a story. Um, I was written out of Chuck Swindoll's uh, a book Chuck Swindoll wrote. And it was a story of this Mrs. Thompson. And she had, um, she had this little boy who kind of had this glazed look on his face all the time, didn't really engage. He was a fifth grader. And he was what we would define as kind of a student you push through the system. But in the end, they're not going to amount to much. She wasn't real nice to him. She actually took delight with a red pen, putting X's on the page, writing an F at the top of the paper and thinking, if you'll have that dumb look on your face when I'm talking to you, then you're going to pay for it. And she just kind of was tough on him. But she knew better. She knew his records that over the last four years, his mom had gotten sick and passed away, that his dad was disinterested and he was just a little boy trying to find his way. But she still took no mercy on him. One day at Christmas, this boy brings a little package up and he puts it on her desk and it's uh, a bottle of cheap perfume and a broken bracelet. The kids laugh. The teacher kind of drums down the noise, puts on the bracelet, puts on the perfume. After the class, the little boy said, do you like my mom's bracelet and her perfume? Then when she came back from Christmas break, she came back a brand new woman. She came back on behalf of that little boy. She didn't hear from him for years. And right before his high school graduation, he wrote, Mrs. Thompson, I graduate next week second in my class. Thank you. Thank you for your time invested in my life. That second half of the year altered his course in life. As he graduated from college, he was in the top 1% of his class. As he graduated from medical school, he kept writing these notes to her. And when he got married, he invited her to come and sit in the parents' place because his dad had died and his mom was gone. And who did he remember but one teacher who invested in his life, though he had a glazed, broken look on his face. She didn't know what broke him, but she knew how to pull the best out of him. And we as Christian teachers must understand, you can speak life or you can speak death. You don't know what's breaking the children in your classroom, but you do know the one who died for them. Treat them as Christ would treat them. Bosses, the same ethic goes to you. The same ethic comes your way. Leaders, we must treat people as God made them valuable, infinitely valuable, and incredibly purposeful. We must never be ashamed to name someone's gift, even if it unseats us. We have to be willing to lead forward. We have to lead not only by example, but by practice. It reminds me of the story of a London pastor who was getting on the tram one day, one Monday morning, and the, and the driver of the tram gave him extra change. He counted it, and he said to himself in his head, I don't have enough for this week. My, how the Lord provides. But his heart kept convicting him. It's a mistake. Give it back. So he went to the tram driver, and he gave the money back to the tram driver, and he said to them, you gave me too much change. It was a mistake, and the driver said, it was no mistake. You preached on honesty yesterday, and I wanted to see if you truly believed it you got to lead by example. you got to lead with integrity. We can't pretend that the abuse of those who work for us is justified in the eyes of God. We receive them as dear brothers and sisters in Christ. And if they are not brothers and sisters in Christ, even more so, may your witness be to Jesus Christ, not to the bottom line and prophets. We must be a church who has integrity about the gospel where we work because we spend a lion's share of our life on the line, in the office, working with people. We must be the people God created us to be, and we were created to be in the image of God, made into the image of Christ through the power of the Spirit. We are not given excuses or allowances to have no integrity in this life. Our work speaks of one. In everything you do, Paul wrote, in all that you put you, your hand to, do it with all your heart as though you're working for the Lord Jesus Christ. You want a practical teaching? You want something to ruin Monday through Friday? This is it. 
your faith goes on display when you leave these doors. And who you are when you punch in matters. So if you're a lawyer, don't pad the clock. If you're a mechanic, don't pad the clock. If you're a construction worker, build to the best of your ability. If you're a pastor, teach, lead, and guide with integrity. If you're a mom, teach your kids humbly how to lead. I've heard moms say in the grocery store, listen here, I rule and you drool. And I want to be like, boo, bad parent alert, and like throw a can of peaches over the thing because it's horrible. What is that teaching kids? No matter your role, there are places you're called to follow with integrity. And some of us are called to lead with integrity. The gospel commands it of us to treat one another the way Christ taught, treated us. Let's just remember for a moment on his last night, he took off his outer garment. He filled a basin with water and washed the feet of unworthy disciples. Jesus Christ saw service as the answer to how we live, not the thing to avoid. We must be people who understand that integrity in how we work and treat people displays the gospel. And people will look at you and say, this is a truly horrible job. Why do you seem to be fulfilled in it? Because it's not your work that's the point. It's your Lord, your master, the one to whom you gave your life after he first gave his for you. Pray with me. God, we come into this place today and quite often we're filled with fear and anxiety that will never be enough. But God, today we put that to rest. And we recognize that many of us have been led by watching leaders who did not live into their God-given identities, and they were crooked, they were dishonest, and they were ungodly, and we ask, God, that you would help correct in us any visions of leadership that was wrong. We ask, Lord Jesus, that we had learned to lead the way you did, serving the least of these and being community with those who maybe don't have the world's attention, but they have yours. Lord Jesus Christ, today we, we confess we are a slave to the grind in this life to have more things, to collect more, to own more, to be more. But today, we, we want to be stepping back from that now, Lord. And we ask, would you help us to grab our identity as children of God in this room? That we all lead from a point of humility and trust in you, God the Father, and not out of a place of confidence of our unique or ununique giftedness. Whatever we're called to do, Lord, may we do it for the glory of you who gave your life for us. Lord, we are not... Uh, willing to forget that Jesus Christ, the high king of heaven, the architect of creation, the one, the first word of creation, the light of the world, washed the feet of some fishermen and said, even as I have done, so you do to one another. May we be people of integrity who serve in our workplaces to the glory of God. We pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Chuck Swindoll in his book on Joseph from the book of Genesis uh, he, he tells a story in that book of a young man who uh, was at a payphone, and there was a guy waiting behind him, and uh, the young man picked up the phone, put his money in, called a number, and he asked the person who answered, are you looking for a young man who is trustworthy, hardworking, and um, someone you, uh, how did he say it, trustworthy, hardworking, someone you can depend on, shows up on time, and um, someone you, you trust in the business? And then the guy on the phone said, no, we've got one of those. And he hung up. And the young man turned, smiling, walked away. And the guy said, why are you smiling? It sounds like you just lost a job. He said, no, I'm that young man. I just wanted to make sure I was right. <laughs> Isn't that solid? Like that, and he, he said, he disguised his voice a little. The guy noticed the phone call. But I just think to myself, sometimes we need to check in and make sure we're not justifying things that hurt the name of Jesus Christ. We need to make sure that we're showing up as Christians in the one life we get with the mentality that we are called to display Christ to the nations. And quite often we do so with our work, with our hands, with our feet. We put the gospel to work with us. Francis of Assisi, the great Catholic saint, said it this way, preach the gospel at all times. When necessary, use words. Your commission is clear this week. People in your places of employment should probably wonder, why are they working like that this week? It's weird. Because you know for whom you work. We are here at the pleasure of the high king of heaven. 
And until he calls us home, our work is clear. Make known to the world the one who died for their sins. As you go about this, may the Lord bless you. May the Lord keep you. May the Lord cause his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord turn his face towards you and give you his peace. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. My friends, it is time for the church to leave the building.